the Buddhists define <coughs> wisdom as the ability to see things as they really are. Or some would say, uh, to see things as they really are lays the ground for wisdom. The Buddha had another comment about wisdom. He said, to the extent that you can do something that you don't want to do because you see that it would lead to happiness is wisdom. And to the extent that you do not do something that you would like to do because you see that it would lead to dukkha or to unhappiness is wisdom. So straightforward, so simple, or as I said the other day, so commonsensical. And I said that, and I was wondering if there really was such a word, and then I went and looked it up, and there really is. So straightforward. To realize that you want to do something, there are things that you like to do, but you realize that doing such and such leads to unhappiness, so you make the decision not to do it. Or, what you don't want to do, you do because you have learned that it leads to happiness. Again, so straightforward. When we think of Buddhist wisdom, we don't tend to think of teachings that are so direct and so simple. We think of philosophically sophisticated teachings like no self. Now, something like no self is interesting. It's interesting to think about. It's interesting to discuss. But when it comes to wanting to get out of bed a few minutes earlier in the morning on a cold winter morning so that you can meditate, no self doesn't really provide much motivation. Whether you find that um, getting up early or not getting up early is a characteristic of a self or no self, doesn't get you out from under the covers. Same thing with um, trying to deal with some sort of addictive behavior. Let's say an addiction to alcohol. The addiction to alcohol is fueled by the feeling that I get pleasure from this drink. And if there is enough pleasure, then one bypasses the dukkha that will be caused later on. And it has nothing to do with whether we think alcohol has inherently a self or no self. It's not of interest. What is of interest is, is this pleasurable? Will I feel happy if I do this? And if it creates enough happiness in the moment, then I will bypass even my experience of serious consequences. And my attachment, my desire to cling, takes over. And I'm caught in that addictive pattern. The way those patterns are broken is through retraining the mind so that we can see the consequences of our actions before we take the action. In the case of serious addictions, of course, people often need help. And fortunately, there is help available. The Buddha taught his own son, Rahula, when he was just seven years old. And he taught him about looking honestly at the consequences of his actions. The Rahula Sutta, as it's called, is about truthfulness and seeing the consequences of your actions. So he said to Rahula, think of your actions as a mirror and that mirror can guide you. You look in the mirror before 
you take an action that you're considering taking. And you look and you see if that action can cause unhappiness to you or to those around you. And if you see that it can and is likely to cause unhappiness, then don't do it. If you don't see that it is likely to cause unhappiness, then feel free to proceed with that action. Then he said, if as you are doing that action, you then see the unforeseen that it is causing dukkha or unhappiness, stop that action. But if you see that it is, again, not causing any unhappiness, feel free to continue. And then he said, even after completing an action, if you then look honestly and see what you didn't anticipate, that that action caused unhappiness, then seek the counsel of someone more experienced on the path and speak to that person and speak honestly. Don't be ashamed to speak of your unskillfulness because if you hide your unskillfulness from someone you respect and someone who can help you, then you are likely to start hiding your unskillfulness from yourself, which means that it will continue. <clears throat> so it's rather amazing that by the way the Buddha taught, he trusted a seven-year-old boy with this kind of teaching. He didn't say to him, this is the right thing to do, this is the wrong thing to do. And that's the way he offered all of his teachings to us. With that confidence that if we look, we will see. If we look, we will gain greater clarity. And from that clarity develops wisdom. This is the relationship between the second and third noble truth. First noble truth being that there is dukkha. The second noble truth being that there is a cause. There is always a cause. And the third noble truth is that there is an end. There is a way to end unhappiness, dukkha, stress, distress. So the relationship between the second and third noble truth always seems obvious. If you see the way in which you cause unhappiness for yourself, you would in that same moment see how to end it. Stop doing what you're doing that causes unhappiness. Well, of course, the big issue is that this is all happening through a human being who has habit energy, which can be very powerful, and conditioning, our conditioned behavior. For years and years and years, we have done things a certain way. We see things a certain way. So the practice of vipassana, <coughs> invites us to look and to see. See how things arise and see if we can now look without what we add on to the bare experience. Because it is in what we add on, in what we create, that suffering really comes about. Seeing bare experience, even, even those factors that the Buddha enumerated when he said, birth is dukkha, old age is dukkha, illness is dukkha, death is dukkha. Even in those, if we look, we can gain a different perspective in dealing with even the most difficult of life's issues being old age, the decaying of the body, illness, which can be physically painful and frightening, 
death, which can be frightening. And the Buddha said, the more we look and gain clarity, the more we see things the way they are, the more we free ourselves from dukkha. This requires patience, courage, and intelligence. And the Buddha said, you have them. So we put teachings out there, and he just simply said, this is what my experience has been. To gain wisdom, you have to have your experience. Wisdom is not gained by what someone else teaches. That is a form of wisdom, as Confucius said, by imitation. But wisdom is gained by your own experience. That will come about, again, patience, courage, because we will make mistakes, we will act unskillfully, we'll act in ways that are unwholesome. But again, with patience, with courage, and with our intelligence, we rise above that and ultimately gain a state of complete awakening. Now I cannot speak from experience as to that factor, but this is what we're told.